Columbus Day, so you're all fantastic. Welcome to the new school, welcome to Eugene Lang College, welcome to the Department of uh, Culture and Media. My name is Trevor Schultz, I'm an Associate Professor for Culture and Media here, and I also convene the Politics of, uh, the Politics of Digital Culture conference series. So the event is hosted by the New School and co-sponsored by LISP NYC, the Graduate Center Digital Initiatives, and the Association for Computing Machinery at NYU. Tonight's speaker hardly needs an introduction. Dr. Richard Stallman launched the free software movement in 1983 and started the development of the GNU operating system. Uh, GNU is free software. Everyone has the freedom to copy it and redistribute it without, uh, with or without any changes. Richard has also been in, uh, inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame. So, at this point, I should probably be talking about how long I know Richard, that we go decades back to MIT or Xerox, but none of this is true. We never met. In fact, I met him about four minutes ago for the first time, so we don't have no issues at all. Uh, but I'm very grateful, personally, for his work, partially because I remember what it was like when I was graduating from college in the late 90s in London. Uh, where I witnessed the black and white dial-up internet, but also was also surrounded by the most state-of-the-art software and hardware. And once I graduated, I lost all of that and couldn't even afford a word processing program. Because, you know, only had access to uh, proprietary software. So this may be uh, something that you also might want to consider if you really want to stick your head into the corporate cloud and become reliant on the Adobe Creative Suite, which upon graduation you will Please. cost you dearly. And there's a distraction. Exactly. It's confusing people. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's all about the cloud. There is no cloud, only other people's computers. It's actually on my page, exactly. That's what I was just about to say. So, all right, so let's, let's not, uh, uh, without further ado, I just try to find any kind of quote or like a sentence from Richard Stallman sort of as a segue and uh, found this one it's where he said, uh, people said that I should accept the world but bullshit, I don't accept the world. And so maybe that's a segue to Pierre who will introduce uh, LISP NYC. <laughs> Um, good evening, folks. My name is Pierre Lacaz, and I'm president of LISP NYC. LISP NYC was founded 14 years ago. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to the advocacy and advancement of LISP based software and functional programming. We focus on education and community. We hold regular monthly meetings and two major social events every year. During the summer of 2012, we organized the LISP and Summer Projects International Programming Competition, empowering 500 participants worldwide to produce nearly 100 software projects which are now freely available. LISP NYC would not be possible without free software which powers our infrastructure. You can find out more about LISP NYC at lispnyc.org. Um, I would like to strongly encourage you to support the Free Software Foundation and Richard Stallman, and you can do that today by purchasing some of the materials that are available in the lobby. Um, finally, we'd like to thank the New School and Trevor Schultz for his hard work in making this event possible. Thank you. I have a question for you. You say that those programs are freely available, but are they free software? They're open source software. Are, well, wait, are, what licenses are they released under? <laughs> it's not clear. They're on GitHub. That doesn't prove anything. <laughs> and if you don't know what license they're under, you don't know they're open source or that they're free software. I'm pretty sure it's under the GNU public license. Oh, the GNU general public license, yes. or GNU GPL. Yes. Well, then they're free software. Okay, great. But you should know that, because it's the most important question about any program. Is it free software or not? If it's not free software, then it's not distributed ethically. That's correct. So, I suggest that you adopt a firm policy that the projects you promote must be released under some free software license. That sounds just about right. <laughs> so, uh, I now have slides to make the talk uh, faster and clearer, but before I start it, I have some requests for you. First, 
if you take photos of me, please do not post them on Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp. That company is a monstrous surveillance engine. It does surveillance on its useds. Uh, it doesn't have users, it has useds. <laughs> and it does surveillance on the rest of the internet too, through like buttons. And it uses face recognition to track people. So if you post a, fa a photo with somebody's <laughs> face in it, in that company, you're helping that company track that person. I recommend you not do that to your friends, and please don't do that to me. <clears throat> please also don't, if you take a photo with an eye thing, make sure that the iCloud feature is turned off so it won't send the photo immediately to an Apple server. And uh, <coughs> if you use an Android device, please make sure that the feature that automatically does a Google search with every photo you take is turned off, because if you did that, you'd be tr letting those companies track me, which is a bad way to treat someone. Second, if you make a recording and you want to distribute copies, please do so only in the formats that are favorable to free software, that is, the AUG formats or WebM. Please do not distribute in the MP formats, because they're patented especially do not distribute in Flash, <laughs> because Flash requires non-free software to watch. And to also avoid Windows Media Player, Real Player, and QuickTime. Please make sure that the distribution site, in its normal operation, lets users download a copy without running any non-free software. Now that might be JavaScript software, in the page itself. That's one of the problems with YouTube. YouTube normally distributes WebM, which is a fine format to use, but it's set up so people can't see it unless they run the non-free software in the page. If you know how, you can bypass that with YouTube DL, but uh, we've got to consider that pe most people would look at YouTube through the normal mechanism. So please don't put it there. And please put on the recording the Creative Commons No Derivatives license, because this is a presentation of a point of view. So what is free software? First of all, it's free as in freedom. It's libre, not gratis. It's uh, <clears throat> not a question of price at all. So, in the introduction, talking about price was actually a distraction from the issue. In the free software movement, we're not concerned with whether you pay to get a copy of a program. It's okay if you get it gratis, it's okay if you pay for one. The issue is, once you've got a copy, does it respect your freedom or does it take your freedom away? That's what makes the program ethical or unethical. Well, what is a program and what's a computer? A computer is a conceptually simple, universal machine. It only knows how to get the next instruction and execute it and then repeat over and over. Get the next instruction and execute it. <coughs> the instructions come from a program. So, Depending on what program it's running, the computer could do anything at all. Well, almost anything. There are some things it can't do. So who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you, when really it's someone else. <laughs> you might think your computer is obeying you, when really it's obeying someone else first, and you second. With any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other. When the users control the program, that's free software. What is freedom? Freedom is having control of your own life, having control of the activities you do in your life. So if you do the activity by using a program, you need to have control over what that program does. So 
When the users control the program, that program respects their freedom. In order for the users to control the program, they need the four essential freedoms. <clears throat> freedom zero is a freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does your activities the way you wish. For that to be practical, not just theoretical, you need the source code of the program. Here you can see some source code. It's sort of like math together with text. And if you understand programming, you can see what that does. You can tell what the program would do, and you can see how to change it. There's an executable program. It's a bunch of ones and zeros. Even for an expert to figure out what that program does is difficult. So in order for freedom one to be real and practical, not merely theoretical, users have to have the source code. Now, these two freedoms give each user separately control over the program. So I can change my copies and you can change your copies. Here we see one user who's decided to change her copies and three other users who are using the program without changing it. Each one of them has freedom separately to change the program. This separate control is essential but not enough because a lot of users don't know how to program. Most people don't know how to program. In fact, they do other things. There are a lot of things in the world to do. <laughs> At least so far. <clears throat> so if all people get is separate control, that's not enough. We need collective control too, which is the freedom to work with others. To, to change the program, to participate in a group with others that want to collaborate with you. Here we see a group of three users that are working together to change the program to do what they want. Two of them are actually changing the program. I guess they're programmers. And then there's a third who's not actually changing the program. Maybe he doesn't know how to program, but together they decide what changes to make. So they all participate in exercising control over what that program does. This is how non-programmers can participate in exercising control over their software and their computing. Not everybody has to be in the group. You know, the people who work together are those that choose to work together. Here we see two other users of the same program who are not participating in that group. Maybe they don't want to. Maybe those three don't want to work with them. Maybe they're just interested in doing different things and have no interests in common. Who knows? But they're all free to work together when they want to with whoever wants to work with them. Collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is, is the freedom to make exact copies and then give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. One particular part of these freedoms, one case, one subcase of them, is sharing. Sharing is when you non-commercially redistribute copies to others. Sharing is an essential part of the bonds of society. <clears throat> Therefore, people must be free to share copies of any published work any attempt to stop or forbid people from sharing copies is an attack on social solidarity, an attack on society. Laws which forbid sharing are directly unjust. We must get rid of those. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
and therefore we should reject propaganda terminology such as pirate, which is used to demonize people who share, who help each other. The term pirate, well, piracy is attacking ships, <laughs> and it's very bad. So when people apply that to sharing, what they're saying is helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. That's from their point of view because they're practicing divide and rule. So let's not give any support to their evil cause. Let's not repeat that propaganda term. Let's refuse to refer to sharing as, quote, piracy, unquote. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say, attacking ships is very bad. Let's send the Navy. <laughs> and when people ask me what I think of movie piracy, I say, I like the first Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> And if people ask me about music piracy, well, I could sing some of, my name is Captain Kidd, who did sail, who did sail, but I won't bore you with the rest. The point is, never accept the idea that, quote, piracy, unquote, refers to sharing. So, if the program comes with these four freedoms, the users have control over the program. It's freedom respecting free software. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the users don't control the program. Instead, the program controls the users, and the developer controls the program, which means this program generates a system of unjust power, power of the developer over the users. By the way, if you're carrying a portable tracking and surveillance device, please turn it off. They've already tracked you here. They already know you're listening to me. And I believe a recording is being made, so if they want to hear what I say, they don't have to listen through your portable tracking and surveillance device, which they can do at any time, you know. Uh, they can just listen to the recording once it's published. So, <clears throat> this is already unjust. Non-free software is an injustice, a system of power that nobody should have. But it leads to additional injustices, because once a company has this kind of power, what's it going to do? It's going to look for ways to take advantage of that power to get more power. So they put in malicious functionalities, such as spying on users, the iThings have an iBeacon, which is a transmitter that makes it easy to follow them around, for instance, in a store, and there are stores that put these sensors in. The Amazon Swindle spies on the user, and it reports from time to time the title of the book being read and which page, and it also reports any notes that the user enters or any underlining. All that gets sent to Amazon. Then there is the functionality of refusing to function. I'm talking about DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, or digital handcuffs. The intentionally designed functionality of refusing to do what the users obviously want. Now, I'm not talking about a mere omission. It's not that they just didn't bother implementing everything the users would like. That in itself is not culpable. Of course, stopping the users from adding what's missing by making the program non-free, that is culpable. But merely failing to add a feature is not. However, that's not what happens here. They work for years figuring out ways to make it impossible for users to do the things they know users will want to do. So here is the dreaded Blu-ray that attacks any users who want to share. And many non-free programs have DRM. Then there are back doors which enable uh, sorts of sabotage. Means someone can 
remotely send a command to do something nasty to the user. For instance, the Amazon Swindle has a black back door for remotely erasing books. We know this because in 2009, Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book, an Orwellian act. And what was the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. If this were fiction, I wouldn't dare make that up. People would say it's too unbelievable. But this is what happened, showing us <clears throat> that the device is monstrous. Amazon, responding to a lot of criticism, promised it would never do this again, ex unless ordered to by the state. Which is not a very comforting promise, but don't worry, Amazon didn't keep it anyway. It wasn't a serious promise. It's one of those promises that are meant to cause temporary confusion to critics, and by the time they discover it's a lie, they've lost their momentum. <clears throat> the guy who uh, increased the price of a medicine by 500%, uh, what was it, 5,000%, I think, uh, he did the same thing. He said, I'll reduce it, and then he didn't. And then there's censorship, pioneered by the iThings. They do censorship of apps. The user can't freely install whatever app she wants to install. She's limited to the apps approved by Apple and posted in Apple's store. Apple practices this censorship in arbitrary ways. <clears throat> For instance, an app that would show people information about U.S. drone attacks has been censored based on bizarre excuses. Information about where to get an abortion has been censored. However, the phony crisis pregnancy centers that are meant to mislead women so that they don't get abortions, they are present. Apple approves of them. Of course, even if Apple's preferences agreed with my political views, I would still condemn censorship. When the users found ways to get around the censorship, they called it jailbreaking, recognizing that these computers are jails for their users. So that's our term for a computer that censors applications. It's a jail. Microsoft does the same thing. And then there is sabotage. When Sony initially sold the PlayStation 3, it had two modes of operation. You could play games on Sony's gaming network or install another operating system, such as the GNU system. <clears throat> then somebody found a way using the GNU system to break some DRM, and so Sony decided to withdraw that mode of operation. But how could it do that to the products already sold? Sony released a firmware downgrade, saying, if you install this downgrade, you will no longer be able to run the GNU system. But if you don't install this downgrade, you won't be able to talk on the gaming network anymore because they had changed the protocol and the old version didn't work. So they forced every user to choose to lose one half of the functionality or the other half. Sabotage. But there's more direct sabotage. Some systems have universal backdoors by which they can forcibly change the software at a distance, at any time. They can install any change at all. So it's a universal backdoor in the same way that a computer is a universal computing device. <clears throat> Windows is an example. Windows XP had a universal backdoor. It was hidden. But people figured it out. In Windows 10, they admitted. This shows how ethical standards continue to fall. Windows XP had spy functionalities uh, that, Windows, that Microsoft did not acknowledge. 
Windows 10, they say you agree that they can look at any file on the system at any time through their universal spying facilities and that they can impose any change whenever they want. <clears throat> so the universal backdoor is the ultimate in malware because it means they can do any nasty thing to the user at any time. Any malicious functionality that is not in Windows today could be remotely installed tomorrow. <coughs> By the way, there is a universal backdoor also in the Amazon Swindle and in nearly all portable phones. Android <coughs> has something that's, all, that's more or less equivalent to a universal backdoor. One non-free component of Android is Google Play. It has a backdoor which can be used to forcibly deinstall or install any application. I don't know whether that's completely equivalent to a universal backdoor or not, but at least it's quite powerful as a backdoor. Another way of mistreating the users is what, what Microsoft does to, with Windows. It shows the NSA security flaws in Windows before it fixes them, thus giving the NSA an opportunity to attack Microsoft's own users. <coughs> I read about this in Bloomberg News. There was an article, I think it was a different one, saying, can anyone trust Microsoft ever again? Well, the answer obviously is no. Well, these examples of malware, by the way, Flash Player also is malware, uh, <coughs> they are so widely used that basically, if you're, user, if you're a user of proprietary software, you're almost certainly a victim of proprietary malware. Why do they do it? Well, it's not that they're sadists. They profit from mistreating users. <clears throat> now, I won't claim that every proprietary program is malware. Most of them I have no knowledge about. It's not easy to find out whether a given proprietary program is malware or not. Some kinds of malicious functionalities are visible. Digital handcuffs are visible. Censorship is visible. The others, you can't tell if, well, you may find out somehow that they're there, but you can never prove they're not. So with any proprietary program, there are two possibilities. Either we know it's malware, or we just don't know. But there's no way to establish that it's not malware, which means the only way to trust it is with blind faith. Proprietary software does computing for suckers. <clears throat> and they have no shame about this either. They have, they have conferences where they present their latest methods of mistreating users. Thirty-two years ago, when I started the free software movement, that was not the case. Proprietary software was an injustice, but most proprietary developers would not put in malicious functionality. And when any was found, it was shocking. It was a scandal. But nowadays, it mostly doesn't even create a scandal. It's expected that proprietary developers will use that proprietary software to wipe the floor with their users. So if you're wise, you will not use proprietary software anymore. Escape and come to the free world that we have built with the GNU operating system plus the Linux kernel, we made the free world.
I started developing GNU in January 1984. The idea was to make a complete operating system that would be entirely free software. In 1992, we had basically all of GNU except one essential piece, the kernel. In February 1992, Mr. Torvalds liberated his kernel, Linux. In 91, when he started it, it was not free software. It was under a license that had a restriction that was too much. However, in 92, he changed to a free software license, and the combination of GNU and Linux made a complete free operating system. For the first time, you could buy a PC and run it in freedom by installing the GNU plus Linux system. <clears throat> so GNU plus Linux is basically a free operating system, but in practice, it's not always so. Because when people make the versions that they distribute of the GNU plus Linux system, nothing stops them from adding some other non-free programs. And in fact, this is a very common thing to do. And the result is a system that's not entirely freedom respecting. You see, the system is a combination of thousands of pieces. In order for a collection of programs to respect your freedom, every piece, every component must respect your freedom. If there's one component that trashes your freedom, the combination as a whole trashes your freedom through that piece. So, in order for a distributed version of the system to be free, we must it must not have had any non-free pieces added to it. Unfortunately, of the more than 1,000 distributions that exist, nearly all have non-free pieces. There are just a few that are entirely freedom respecting, and those are the ones we recommend. In gnu.org slash distros, you can find information about which distros are free and which are not. And for the well-known distros which are non-free, we explain how so. Among the worst distros is Ubuntu. Ubuntu has a substantial amount of non-free software that it installs and more that it offers. And in addition, it's one of the rare examples of free software that spies on people. See gnu.org slash philosophy slash ubuntu spyware.html. Now, why is it that free software doesn't usually spy on people? Why does proprietary software typically spy on people? Because the developers have power over the users and they know it, and that tempts them to put in malicious functionalities. This power corrupts them. Well, in the free world, we developers know that we don't have power over the users, that the users control the program. We could put something in that's nasty and the users could take it out. Because power is the, to make it stay in there is what we don't have. And we know this, so we don't feel the same temptation. And as a result, generally, we stay honest. Free software is the only known defense against malware. When the users control the program, they generally get what they want. It's not a perfect defense, as Ubuntu proves. But it's the only known defense, and it's a lot better than being defenseless like proprietary software users. <clears throat> now, Beyond what's installed in your system and applications, there's other software that may run on your computer. Web pages often contain programs. They're written in the JavaScript language. That's a technical detail, but it's a good way to identify which programs we're talking about. So as you browse the web, 
sites may send these JavaScript programs to your browser and then they run on your computer and the browser doesn't even tell you. These programs can be free or non-free, just like any other program. Most of them are non-free. Now, I didn't want to run those non-free programs or any non-free programs on my computer. So, for a while, I just kept JavaScript turned off. But now we have something called LibreJS. It's a program that analyzes all the JavaScript code in the web pages that tries to get into your browser to see if it's either trivial or free. And in those cases, it allows that JavaScript code to run. But if a program is non-trivial and non-free, LibreJS blocks it and warns you. And it does one other thing. It searches heuristically through the site for how to send complaints to the webmasters so that you can quickly and easily complain and say, I can't use your site because you have non-free JavaScript code. Please free your JavaScript code or make the site work without it. And otherwise, goodbye. <laughs> it's very important to complain in this way. You don't have to go into the details because it will put those details in the message for you. So you can complain very quickly. There's one other way to lose control of your computing, and that is if you entrust it to somebody else's server. Actually, I just remembered there's one other point I should mention about JavaScript. Please raise your hand if you write JavaScript code. I'm looking for people to solve a problem. Some New York subway stations have Wi-Fi networks, which I can't connect to because the portal requires running non-free JavaScript code. I'm looking for somebody who wants to study that JavaScript code and see how it works and figure out a way to bypass it <laughs> and post that and then I'll be able to connect in the subway station. <laughs> and so will other people be able to connect without running their non-free JavaScript code. <clears throat> Even better, once that step is done, someone could write a free extension for Firefox to do the same job as that JavaScript code and thus, and since it will be free software, it'll solve the problem. Instead of running their non-free JavaScript code, you'll run this extension. It might also be written in JavaScript, but that's not a problem as long as it's free software. So this way, people will be able to use those Wi-Fi networks without running non-free software, and it will work smoothly for everyone. So please work on this if you want to make a difference. It's a fairly easy job compared with many other things that need doing. And it's something that those of you who are in that field have the skills for. So, back to service as a software substitute. That's when you entrust your own computing activity to somebody else's server. So you lose control over it. You don't control what that server is going to do. The server operator controls it. So this is another way to lose control over your computing activity. The old way is do it with a non-free program. You have the non-free program in your computer, but you don't control what it does, so you don't control your computing. With service as a software substitute, you don't even have the copy of the program that's doing your computing. It's a copy belonging to somebody else in his computer, so of course you have no control over it. Even if it's a free program, it's not your copy. You, if you have a copy of a free program, you have control over it, but this copy's not yours. So even if the servers were doing your computing with a free program, you still don't control that computing. The server operator can change that copy. You can't. So, for control of your computing, you must reject 
SAS. So SAS is equivalent to running a non-free program in its effects because you don't control the computing it does. But it's actually worse because in order to use SAS, the user has to send all the pertinent data to the server. Now, as I explained, many non-free programs send the data they operate on to somebody's server because they're spyware. Well, with SAS, the mechanism is different. The user explicitly sends the data, but it's the same result. The server has the user's data and will probably show it to Big Brother. So, <clears throat> SAS is effectively equivalent to spyware, but it's worse. As I explained, many non-free programs have a universal backdoor that allows the developer to remotely impose software changes and thus change how the user's computing gets done without asking the user for permission to change it. Well, with SAS, the server operator, of course, can install different software in the server, and he should be free to do so. It's his computer. But this leads to bad consequences because that computer is doing somebody else's computing, not his computing. And so when he changes that software, he changes how all those users' computing gets done without asking them for permission to change it. So SAS, by the structure of how it works, is equivalent to running a non-free program which spies on the user and has a universal backdoor. It's the equivalent of malware, so don't use it. So we want to be free, but we have to cross some obstacles. One of them is the companies that impose their power on users through non-free software have accumulated lots of money with that, and they use that money to try to stop people from escaping. They do it through lobbying, they do it through essentially corrupting governments that were thinking of moving to free software. You know, if you pay a politician, that's a crime, but if you pay the state, that's not a crime. These companies can easily buy the state and it's not a crime, they don't have to hide it. Legally, it's not considered corruption, but in practice, it is. For instance, they say, uh, adopt this law we want, and we'll spend a million dollars a year running a research center in your country or your state. Many governments will cheerfully change their policies in exchange for that. So when these companies show up to sell things, to recruit people, we have to protest them. Another obstacle is that many people don't even know about free software. They never talk about free software. They never hear anyone talk about free software. Instead, they hear discussion of something else, quote, open source, unquote, a term that I never use. This term was coined in 1998, that is 14 years after the start of the free software movement. It was meant to refer to the same set of programs, but completely hide the ethical issue. They intended to talk about all the free programs, exactly that much and no more. They used a definition that's written differently so, in fact, the line didn't come out at exactly the same place. It turns out there are a few cases of programs that are open source but not free. They're rare. You'll probably never come across any source code that's open source but not free. There, it exists, but it's so unusual you'll never, you probably will not come across it. In practice, all free programs are open source and almost all open source programs are free. But, so in practice, they're almost the same set of programs. But 
in principle, they're as different as you can get because they're based on different values. Free software is an ethical issue. It's about your freedom and your community. The whole point of open source was to avoid talking about freedom. To avoid raising the issue as a matter of right or wrong. So, where we say, if you develop a program and distribute it, it's your moral duty to respect the user's freedom to change and redistribute the program. They say, if you develop and distribute a program, we suggest you consider letting the users change and redistribute it. It might be in your practical interest to do so, because then the users can improve the code quality. So, we say that developers have a moral obligation to respect the freedom of the users of their code. And that's what open source wants to forget. They do not wish to question that the moral legitimacy of proprietary software. That's too radical for them. They wanted to get, they wanted to appeal to executives so they decided to hush up anything executives might not like. And they didn't end up appealing to very many executives, but they sure succeeded in getting a lot of people to forget about the issue of right and wrong. <clears throat> so that's why I do not advocate or promote open source. I mostly don't go to activities that use the term open source, because whatever I'm doing, I wanted to promote the idea of free software as well. Where you stand is up to you, but if you agree with me, I hope you'll do the same as I do, and insist on saying free software, not open source. Now there's a lot of confusion about this point about what constitutes free software and what constitutes open source. A program is free software if it's released under a free software license. There are many different free software licenses. The most commonly used one is the GNU General Public License. But that's not the only free software license. There are many more. The GNU GPL is a copyleft license. That means it has a particular condition, a requirement, saying if you redistribute copies, either exact or modified or extended, your copies must carry the same license. They must be distributed under the same terms. You must make the source code available. In other words, you must pass along to others the same freedom you got from us. We use copyleft because we want to make sure all users of the code get the freedom we aim to give them. But there are other free software licenses which don't do copyleft. Like there are two different BSD licenses. If somebody says the BSD license, he's confused because he's failing to say which one. And then there are, there are other lax, permissive, pushover licenses. And then there are some that are sort of semi-copyleft. For more details, look at gnu.org slash licenses slash license list dot html. You'll see dozens of free software licenses listed there and dozens of other licenses which are non-free and it says why. <clears throat> and uh, those same licenses are also open source licenses, but there are some other open source licenses which are too restrictive so they don't qualify as free. Fortunately, most of them are not used. And the rest of, all in all, those non-free open source licenses are used on very few programs. <clears throat> well, in 1998, the majority of our computer, of, of our community, would have held the open source philosophy and they switched to using that term. And 
The companies in the community almost all switched to that term, and the journalists and politicians followed the businesses, and since then in the major media, you never see free software. You only see open source and open. The word open is warm and fuzzy and doesn't stand for anything in particular. And this was a great setback. It means that we have to work very hard to make people aware that the free software movement still is here. Some articles claimed that open source had replaced the free software movement, that we were just a precursor. And that was rather insulting of them. Uh, and when people hear about me, they generally hear the misinformation that claims I support open source. Every week people write to me thanking me for what I've contributed to open source. <laughs> so I have to politely explain to those people that they've been misinformed, that I don't agree with open source, never did, was never in favor of that, and I'm doing something that I think is more important and deeper and that I hope they will support. And I show them the article gnu.org slash philosophy slash open source misses the point dot html. <laughs> I've even seen articles that call me the father of open source. <laughs> so I send a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination using <laughs> stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> then I explain the ideas and name of the free software movement, which were missing from the article, obviously, so that the readers of that periodical will see them. And that's the real point of the letter, but I like starting with a joke. <laughs> now you can help this too. Just by insisting on saying free Libra software and not saying open source, especially when the people you're talking with are saying open source, you can help spread awareness of the free software movement. We need this help very much. <clears throat> and another obstacle is when there's hardware that we can't write free software for because its specs are secret. Very often, the manufacturer will sell you the product and refuse to tell you how to use it. They say, here's a non-free program to control the hardware. Run it and shut up. Well, obviously, we shouldn't run it. <coughs> so what do we need to do? We need reverse engineering. We need to figure out the specs of that product, figure out how to run it. We need to figure out what the commands are to make it do things and write that down. And then that will show someone else how to write a free program to run that hardware. We have lots of people who can do that, but the reverse engineering is the hard job. If you want to make a big technical contribution to the free world, do reverse engineering. And schools that teach technical fields should have courses in reverse engineering. It's a very important field, and I'm told that there is, uh, that the people are in great demand <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it's a, a lucrative career as well. But above all, schools should teach free software. They should teach free software in the sense that when they have the students use a program, it better be free. But in addition, the school should teach students why they have that policy. They should teach students the civics of free software. And every class should have a rule against distributing non-free software there. Because distributing or, or teaching how to use it, because giving kids proprietary software is like giving them tobacco. It's 
getting them hooked, making them dependent. And that's why proprietary software companies often offer gratis or cheap copies of their non-free software to schools or children to get them addicted, just as tobacco companies used to offer them gratis cigarettes. The school should refuse on principle to participate in getting students hooked on these non-free programs. And the class should say, don't bring non-free software to class unless it's for reverse engineering. <laughs> Every class should have the following rule for the sake of moral education. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with the rest of the class, including the source code in case someone here wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, it's not permitted to bring proprietary software to class unless it's for reverse engineering. The school, to set a good example, must follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class with source code and share copies with everyone in the class that wants them, except for the exercises for reverse engineering practice. But there's another reason and that is for the sake of education. You see, every program embodies knowledge. If it's proprietary, that knowledge is secret. It's withheld from the students. If it's free software, the program offers its knowledge to the students. So the free program supports education, and the non-free program is the enemy of education. It's the enemy of the spirit of education and should never be tolerated in a school. Schools must show their loyalty to the spirit of education. They must not betray that spirit for some minor convenience. <clears throat> Human rights depend on each other. If you lose one, if one is taken out, the others tend to collapse because we can't defend them anymore. Now that we use software for so many important activities, free software, control over our computing, is one of the human rights that we need in order to defend the other human rights. We must insist on it. And we must look at any non-free program as a temptation for us to surrender our human rights. Sometimes defending your freedom requires a sacrifice. I've met people who said, oh, I'll be happy to switch to free software when you provide me a free program that does absolutely everything this non-free program does equally, easily, and I won't lose the tiniest little bit. What that person is saying is uh, that for him, Freedom is worth exactly zero. Of course, those people will lose their freedom. To keep your freedom, you have to defend it. That has always been true, and it's true in our field as well. So there may be a, th a thing you can't do with your computer, because to do it, you have to give up your freedom and that is, or should be, unthinkable. So how can you help the cause? Well, if you're a programmer, you can write free software. But if you're not a programmer, there are many important things you can do. You can organize to campaign for the use of free software. You can learn to be a speaker and present these ideas in your way to other people. That's a tremendously important contribution. You can persuade schools and governments to migrate to free software. Look at gnu.org slash education and gnu.org slash philosophy slash government free software .html. <clears throat> You can help other users, for instance, start a GNU slash Linux user group. 
And just saying free software helps us. <clears throat> so, at this point, I'd like to mention a little more about where to get more information. GNU.org slash licenses gives all the information about free software licensing. In licenserecommendations.html, you'll see information, suggestions for how to choose a license for your work. You'll also find in that directory information about the correct way to apply the GNU General Public License or GNU GPL and other GNU licenses. Uh, it's very important to go through those steps carefully and apply it correctly. Especially on GitHub, you will find many examples of programs in which the licensing is ambiguous. GitHub is a very bad influence in this regard. You'll also find many programs with no stated license at all. Those programs are not free software. They're also not open source for whatever that's worth. For the same reasons, because there's no license giving users any permissions. So users have no permissions. The way copyright, copyright law, law works today is everything that's written is automatically copyrighted and by default you're not allowed to copy it or change it or basically do anything with it. And th that makes the program non-free unless there's a free software license that gives the users the four freedoms. That's what a free software license is for. That's why we use them. It's the statement by the copyright holder saying, yes, you're allowed to do these things. And without that statement, the program is non-free. GNU.org slash distros gives the information about which distros are free and the, non, the widely used ones that are non-free. GNU.org slash philosophy addresses many political issues. GNU.org slash proprietary gives information about many examples of malicious functionalities found in a wide range of proprietary programs. It's organized by type of malware and by company that's responsible. By the way, Volkswagen showed us a new kind of malicious functionality recently, lieware. <laughs> So now that example is in there along with the spying Barbie doll and the spying TVs and all the other nasty things. <clears throat> and GNU.org slash GNU gives information about, <clears throat> about the history of the GNU system. By the way, the name GNU is a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix. <coughs> and this is an adorable GNU that needs a home. So we also have the site fsf.org for the Free Software Foundation. Uh, every month we send out a mailing if you'd like to receive the mailing, you can write your email address down on the paper outside. You can join the Free Software Foundation. That's our main source of funds, is members' dues. So please do join. You can do it through fsf.org if you wish to pay digitally, or you can fill out a piece of paper here and give me cash, <laughs> if you prefer as I do to avoid digital payments. This button says, don't be tracked, pay cash. And I follow my own advice very thoroughly. <clears throat> so now it's time to present my other identity.
on? Is it working? That's my mic with the video. Oh, I see. So I, I need to use both. <coughs> I am Saint Ignatius <laughs> of the Church of Emacs. <laughs> I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Emacs started out as an extensible text editor program that I had written, but developed over the years into a way of life for many users, as it was extended so much they could do all their computing without ever leaving Emacs. And then it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs, <laughs> which you might find amusing to visit. <clears throat> In the Church of Emacs, we have a great schism between several versions of Emacs, and we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. <laughs> to be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must pronounce the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> then if you become a true expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant a portion of our sacred scripture, that is to say, the system source code. <laughs> In the Church of Emacs, we have eliminated the priesthood of technology because everyone is free to read our sacred scripture. We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs, which refers to anyone who has never used Emacs. <laughs> According to the Church of Emacs, offering the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. <laughs> We also have the Emacs Pilgrimage, which, ref which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. <laughs> there is a breakaway Tibetan sect which claims that it's sufficient to invoke them automatically under the control of the script. <laughs> However, the mainstream church holds that to gain spiritual merit, you must type them by hand. <laughs> The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't name. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. <laughs> <clears throat> However, it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise the evil proprietary operating systems that have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use and install a wholly free operating system. And then use and install only free software with and on the system. By the way, I hope you noticed that wholly free system, in, in wholly free system, the word wholly can be spelled in more than one way. <laughs> If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you'll have the right to wear a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> there is a traditional rivalry between Emacs and the other text editor, VI. So people occasionally ask me if in the Church of Emacs using VI is a sin. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> Last year I went to China and I was shocked that some VI users proposed getting together to attack me. What can I say? Apparently, uh, violence begins with the eye. <laughs> People have occasionally asked whether my halo is really an old computer disc. <laughs> 
this is no computer disk, this is my halo. <laughs> but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. <laughs> Thank you. This, this is an adorable GNU that needs a home, so I'm going to auction it for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy it, I can sign the card for you. If you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin, because as we all know, a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> We can accept payment in cash, with a check, or with a credit card if it can be used for phone purchases or debit card, <clears throat> or with Bitcoin if you have something here to make the payment with. There will also be time for you to go to an ATM and come back while I answer questions. When you bid, please wave, shake your hand, you know, wave it, and shout the amount as loud as you can, because I have hearing trouble. And when you bid, you want me to notice, right? If a bid happens in a place where nobody hears and sees it, <laughs> did it really happen? <clears throat> and the initial price is $25. Do I get 25 or more? How much? 30. I've got 30. Do I get 35? How much? 40. I've got 40. Do I get 45? How much? 50. I've got 50. Do I get 55 or more? I've got 50. Do I get 55 or more for this adorable thing? <laughs> How much? 60. I've got 60. Do I get 65? Or... How much? There's a question 70. over here. Is it tax deductible? Uh, no, because it's a purchase. 70. I've got 70. Do I get 75 or more for this adorable GNU? <laughs> 75 or more to the Free Software Foundation. How much? 76.43. I've got 76.43. Uh, do I get 80? <laughs> How much? 80. I've got 80. Do I get 85 or more for this adorable canoe? <laughs> 85 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? How much? What? 90. I've got 90. Do I get 100? I've got 90. Do I get 100 for this adorable canoe? <laughs> A hundred to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? A hundred. I've got a hundred. Do I get one ten? One, how much? One twenty-eight. I've got one twenty-eight. <laughs> I've got one twenty-eight. Do I get one forty? I've got one twenty-eight. Do I get one forty for this adorable canoe? <laughs> 140 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance to bid 140 or more. Last chance for this adorable GNU. Going, going, gone for 128. Please come up. So how would you wish to pay? Uh, I, I have a credit card or I could... Okay. Uh, to use the credit card, you have to write all the data on paper and show me them both. Or you can go and get cash. Okay. Which do you want to do? I'll, uh, I can write, I'll write down. Okay. Um, I'll give you a piece of paper. <laughs> Thank you. 
I have one more GNU. Would the man over there like to get it? <laughs> oh, yes, I do. And also, I'd like it a phone number or email address. <laughs> So now it's time for questions. I still have hearing problems. I'd like people to come here and make a cue and ask the questions at this microphone. But even using the microphone, you have to speak loud. And please do visit the table outside where we are selling. And uh, could those who were manning the table please go back to it? Uh, I hope you will support us. The books and shirts and buttons there are much cheaper than the GNU turned out to be. <laughs> uh, good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, and do take stickers. The stickers are gratis. <laughs> I. Uh, I very much enjoyed your talk, and I wanted to ask you something uh, about SAS and your comments on SAS. Uh, it is often the case that uh, somebody else, a, a friend or sometimes another company, has more computing resources than I do to run that same computation or do that. Computation. What computation do you actually need more computing resources for? Video encoding would be one example. Uh, analyzing some sort of data set that might... So analyzing a data set, that's a, sure. an unusual professional activity. Are you doing this for a company by any chance? Uh, in some cases I'm doing it for a company, in other cases I'm, for example, analyzing uh, the New York City data set with respect to... Uh, so well, for, I should point out that this is a rare thing. Most people never do anything like this. Well, my question Second, is, do you have uh, guidance for an ethical okay, framework? Listen, listen, I'm trying to answer. Sure. If you control the software that does it, then it's not SAS. SAS is when you say, here's some data, just do this for me. If you're using a remote server and you choose the software to run in it, that's different. Then it's then you control that computing. Sure. That answers my question. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can sit down and still get heard through this microphone. There's a, there's a wireless? Oh, there you go. Cool. This should work. I have more or less the same question. Is it either a, a sin or a penance to provide or use um, software on a real <laughs> server that is, itself is not free software or using data that is itself not right. I heard the beginning and then I started oh, to cough. Sorry. On a remote server and after that, what? That you don't control, uh, is, it, is there a sin or a penance to use software you don't control on a remote server, so software as a service? Should, well, if you're doing your own computing, then you shouldn't do it that way. On the other hand, there are other scenarios. Maybe you're, maybe you're helping the, commuti the computing of whoever has that computer. Suppose you're editing Wikipedia. You're not doing your own computing. You're doing Wikipedia's computing on Wikipedia's computer, so it's all proper. Okay. What, I, what if I want to be tracked and pay not by cash, for instance? And you Sorry, someone... you want to be tracked? Well, or I'm ready to pay the price of being tracked for well, convenience well, of paying someone remotely <coughs> without cash. That's a different issue. That's the surveillance issue. Now. We all have a duty to fight against surveillance because otherwise we'll have no choice. So for instance, I've been trying to convince a city councilman that the city should require all car ride services to offer an anonymous call and payment system. 
<coughs> and I think we need more people pushing for that. There are many disgusting things about Goober. I call it Goober because it pays drivers peanuts. But the worst thing about Goober is that it tracks people and requires them to run non-free software. For those reasons, for either of those reasons, I would never be a user of Goober. But I'm afraid that there may be no taxis. We should demand that Goober respect anonymity as well as demanding that it pay drivers a decent wage. Thank you for being here. Um, and I enjoyed your talk too. Um, so Elon Musk talked recently about uh, artificial intelligence and being worrisome about government control <coughs> and just uh, you know, essentially like a Terminator-like future with AI. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I see that danger, but I can't see the future. So I don't know whether we can have AI and avoid that danger. And I think nobody does. Right. Right? One can only guess. The thing about superhuman intelligence is that we can't predict what it will do. And we couldn't tell what it was doing even if we were watching it. I wrote a story in which there's a superhuman intelligence. <clears throat> there are lots of them. Uh, this, in the story, I paid a company to make a, uh, a sweetheart for me. <clears throat> And the sweetheart was an AI that was, in fact, a superhuman intelligence. But because she loved me, she made sure that I was OK. <laughs> and of course, she was a good person, so she didn't hurt others either, unless there was a good reason. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. Um, my question is, do you think it's viable or a possible to have a truly free smartphone? And if not, then uh, what needs to change about it? It's theoretically viable. It's not possible. And unfortunately, it's illegal. And given that the phone system can track the phones regardless of their cooperation, there's only one way I can see that phones could be made safe in terms of surveillance. The idea is to put a one-way pager in the phone. And someone who wants to contact you pages you first. You get the page even though the radio of your phone is turned off. At that point, when you see who's trying to contact you, you can decide when and whether to turn your phone on to talk with that person or to talk with that person in some other way. <clears throat> So you could decide to wait until you're in a place where you don't mind your locations being known. Or you could decide to ignore it because it's not important enough and you're in a place that you don't, really don't want to be tracked. So that way, it could be safe. Uh, you touched briefly in your talk uh, on the idea of uh, open source versus free software. Um, and I've noticed uh, historically that uh, there are certain like uh, kind of fair weather friends of free software who have uh, used free software when it uh, was technically superior um, and uh, not used it when it uh, didn't provide functionality that they wanted. I would rather say, because after all, they're the ones who lose freedom when they use non-free software. So I wouldn't describe this as fair weather friends. It's not for our sake that they should want freedom, it's for their sake. Right. So I would say that those are people who don't value freedom, don't value their own freedom. And so they, they choose based on convenience alone, and I would say that's uh, foolish. Uh, I agree. Um, but adding on top of that, um, if so, those users don't necessarily value their own freedom. Uh, 
but we can value that for them. Uh, and is there a way that we can uh, create, f like if there was a, a way that we could create free software uh, that was able to bring those people back, where do you think the priorities would be for that? Well, there are several priorities. We need better software for CAD. We need better uh, speech generation software. We need dictation software. <clears throat> I'm not sure what else we need in the way of applications now, but we need many, we need replacements for many non free drivers and firmware at the low levels of our systems. Hi, um, I have a two part question, I'm gonna to try to be concise. Um, the first thing is, do you think that if all software development had been free from the beginning, technology would have advanced at the speed and complexity that it has? Um, I have no idea, but I don't think it matters. Here's why. Because freedom is more important than technical progress. Well, that, that's uh, kind of the second part to my question is, um, given that technology can pose substantial benefit to human quality of life and especially help people who are in extreme poverty, um, I think it's demonstrably um, true that proprietary software has grown faster and more efficiently and been distributed wider. I won't use the proprietary software, so I, I wish it didn't exist. So, so my, my question is, it, isn't freedom or privacy, are those not like luxuries on top of other absolutely things? Absolutely not. Freedom is absolutely essential. Nobody is so poor that she doesn't need freedom. It's a mistake to surrender our freedom to and let someone subjugate us for some kind of practical benefit. <clears throat> it's 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 short-term shallow thinking. It's better to go slowly along the right road than to go quickly along the wrong road. It's better to make a, a little good than a lot of bad. A proprietary program attacks people's freedom. And the more successful it is, the more pressure there is on people to surrender their freedom to it. So it's better if it's a failure, and it's even better if they never tried to make it at all. Now, it may appear in the short term that there's a choice between proprietary software and no software. I think no software is better. That's what my choice will be, and is. But in the long term, the choice is between proprietary software and free software. Because the success of the proprietary software removes a lot of the motive to make the free software. A lot of software development is funded by governments. We could have all that be free. We can have as much free software development as we want as a society. So <clears throat> we shouldn't choose, make a short-term choice for our long-term decision. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Stallman. I uh, would like to have, um, I'd like to ask you on your, uh, your thoughts of having a, a distributed web, one where... We have a distributed web, except to the extent some, some companies have tried to grab control of it, and Facebook is now, and Google are now trying to grab even more control. Well, <coughs> well, recently I read about an organization that was trying to implement uh, a software um, protocol called um, IPFS, and their intention is to replace HTTP so that every computer... Okay, I don't know what this uh, is. Uh, oh, the, the intention is to make the computers on the internet act like nodes in a torrent network. So whenever someone accesses a web page, they make a copy of it. So when government goes after a particular website, they can't take it down because now many... I see. Um, well, it might be a good idea. 
Okay. It's a different issue from the one I've been talking about. Okay. And I don't know anything about it specifically, okay. so I can't say much, but it might be a good idea. Okay. Hi, thanks for coming and, and that was a really good talk also. Um, as a developer who sometimes works on JavaScript applications, um, I find myself using libraries a lot. And there's a particular library that uh, I believe, I don't know much about licenses, but I believe it's under the BSD3 clause um, license. And That's a free license, so. It's, but the problem is that there's a gray area, I think maybe because it's released by Facebook. And I don't see why that would matter. Do you, okay, so that you find that to be a defensible sort of... Yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> reject a program on account of who developed it. Right. If it's released as free software, then we can use it. And you wouldn't recommend boycotting Facebook until they make I all of their software? I wouldn't recommend rejecting okay. a program okay. just because of who its author was. Okay, thanks. Hello. Um, I'd like to know your opinion about uh, Bitcoin, what your personal <laughs> thoughts are, maybe uh, if you could expand on how okay. it affects us. Bitcoin is good in that it enables us to bypass the payment companies that used to be able to stop us from sending money to somebody like, for instance, to WikiLeaks. <clears throat> However, for ordinary purchases, I'm unhappy about the fact it's not anonymous. And at the same time, I'm unhappy that it's, it tends to lend itself to tax evasion. Now, it's true that the worst forms of tax evasion are lawful and permitted by plutocratic governments, including our own. But still, uh, I don't want it to be possible to, uh, for companies to just get their payments this way and then not pay taxes by not reporting that. We are developing something called GNU Taller. See Taller.net, T-A-L-E-R.net, which is an anonymous payment system which is mathematically anonymous. Uh, it's not possible to establish who made a payment. But once the payments are made, uh, the payee has to take those payments to essentially a bank and convert them into money. So it can't be used for tax evasion. But uh, wouldn't that then allow, basically, you're saying that a third party would have control? Like, wouldn't these banks basically well, the can banks, decide whether yes, they want they to accept would. the payment or not? Yes, well, they would decide who can participate in the system. Yeah, but wouldn't it be better if the users get to decide that rather than Maybe a third it would, party? But, but on the other hand, what I want most is when I buy something from a store, no one tracks what I buy. Mm -hmm. And I don't want the store to be able to uh, disguise the payments and not pay taxes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, I have a more open-ended question than a lot of them. Uh, you've done a lot over the years in various areas. Uh, I wonder if there are any big uh, things that you sort of wish you had done differently? I don't like to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions. First one. On any given day, there's a good chance that I'm working with people who insist on referring to software as open source rather than free and doing other non-free bullshit. And I personally don't care about that, so I often leave the job or get myself fired. But what, 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 what? Can't hear you. You spoke too fast. Ah, uh, sorry. I personally don't care for this bullshit, so I often get myself fired or leave the job. Why do you get... You don't have to be fired, just... They wouldn't fire you no, just because no. you said free software. No, no, it's more than that, because I, I talk about all the ethics of it and they don't I like see. that. Um, so, uh, beyond leaving the job... What system is running in this smack uh, It is very unfortunate. I got this from work. Oh. Well, that's more important Wait, wait, no, no, this is, no, no, no. <laughs> this is a specific situation, but I'm asking about the broader thing. Beyond leaving a job, what, where people are, are so into their non-free ways, uh, what can I uh, do for them? Well, you, there's no magical recipe for changing people's views. Okay. So, you give it a try, 
if and sometimes you'll get them to start thinking differently and sometimes they'll ignore you and then you've got to let it drop nagging won't be very effective okay but i would suggest that the more important than what they talk about is what they make you do so i wouldn't work in a place where they made me run smack us but I might work in a place where they talked about open source if what I were doing were free software. Okay. And it probably would. Of course, why wouldn't it be? If they had me work on an open source project, that would almost certainly be a free software project. The thing is, because what's missing from the idea of open source is the idea that non-free software is wrong, Often, those that talk about open source develop lots of programs that are not open source and they're not free software either. Or they use lots of those and they make their free programs work with the non-free ones. Yeah. It's because the idea that non-free software is something bad that you should kick out is what they reject. So, I guess it would depend on the facts, you know. If, if a place talked about open source, but they were willing to hire me to write a free program, and they didn't stop me from saying it's free software, I would, I might still work for them. Okay. Um, the second question. Um, clearly, all free, all software should be free, regardless of whether I'm releasing the software. Um, well, if you don't release it, it is free. Well, no, it's in a trivial way. Oh, it's sorry. Really I mean, free. Okay. The situation I'm just thinking is. Um, it might make sense for me to provide software to one client where the software is hard coded to use private information from the client. <coughs> In this case, the, the well, client. Well, you should release it to that client as free correct. software, but the client doesn't. Exactly. Remember, the four freedoms are no, no, optional, exactly. not mandatory. But in this software, it might be components that I could release to the general public. They're not necessary for the overall project, but they might be some totally yeah. relevant. And, um, and so it would, decide, it would be good those. to release them. Is there any? Yeah. But it's possible that maybe I'll accidentally do something. Or it, is there um, any complicated ethical consideration? You just this? make sure the client understands what's specifically for that client and what general purpose. Okay. I got commissions to write code that I was going to release. In fact, that's what the client wanted me to do. I was getting paid to make improvements in GNU programs with the explicit understanding that I was going to release that code after. <clears throat> so if there's a, let's, they understand that they're going to get um, whatever they ask for and then it's going to use a lot of free software underneath. Yeah. But um, let's say they might not be clear that I'm going to write Make it free. clear. Okay. Make it clear. Tell them, right? That's okay. the solution for this kind of problem. Okay. Just make, tell the client what you're going to do. Thanks. Hi, I have a simple request. I would just like you to sign this book. I can't hear Sorry, you. Sorry, uh, I have a simple request. I would just like for you to sign this book. I'm going to sign books after the questions. Perfect. Hello. Um, my question is about uh, voluntary, I want to say like voluntary tracking or voluntary uh, giving up of information. Like, in several open source projects that I know. Are they free software projects? I'm actually not sure. It depends upon whether or not this is ethical. But, well, what, um, actually, no, that's a separate question. Uh, do you know what licenses they carry? I think one of them carries MIT, so that would be free. Yeah. And well, actually, there is no MIT license. That's ambiguous there. No. There is the XPAT license, and there's the X11 license, and they're different. <clears throat> And so you shouldn't talk about the MIT license. That term is just misleading. I actually didn't know that. Off the anyway, but that program is clearly free software. Yeah, but they have voluntary data collection where you're able to um, send user statistics and stuff like that to a I don't see any harm in it if you have to enable it for it to, you, if it only sends the data if you ask it to. And uh, if you don't need to do that to get it to work for you. What if it's enabled by default? Then it's nasty. Then it's spyware. And they should, uh, they should fix that. <clears throat> now, it's still free software. 
that's a separate question. Because of the fact it's free software, users can make a modified version which does not send that information by default. And uh, for websites, where you would be tracking like page views and analytics of that nature? I think the what site the should one? not track full IP addresses. Okay. It should hash code them and change the seed every day in such a way that it gets the information it needs, but no visitors can be identified from the logs. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Given the freedom of redistribution, what's, what, what's a strategy for non-gratis free software? <clears throat> well, you're right that nowadays, just selling copies is not a common business model. It worked for me in 1985 very nicely. It worked very well for the Free Software Foundation for around seven or eight years. <clears throat> but nowadays, other business models are used, for instance, selling support and uh, selling physical products with the software, uh, getting, uh, having, you know, selling the extension of the program to clients that want to make want solutions made for their specific needs. <clears throat> Crowdfunding. <laughs> Crowdfunding works very well. And uh, also selling exceptions. If the program is normally released under the GNU GPL, then that doesn't permit including the code in a non-free program. So the developer can sell permission to a particular developer to include that same code in a non-free program, and that's called selling exceptions. Thank you. I was actually gonna ask about, like, I guess more about your views on the companies that will release software to certain people under a proprietary license than to other people under a free software license. Well, if they're releasing it under a free software license, that's ethical. And then, if they sell an exception, permitting someone else to use the same code in different ways, that code is still free software. In fact, they could go even further than that and release all that code under a pushover license. And everyone agrees that's free software. We're not going to say they're doing anything wrong if they did that. It might not be the best the best way to defend freedom, in my view, but it's not wrong. Well, that permits everybody to put that code into proprietary programs. So if they only sell certain individuals or certain companies that permission to use that code in proprietary programs, that's less than what they would permit by releasing it under, say, one of the uh, pushover licenses. What so that's not wrong either. What about the case where the different versions that are released under proprietary license? Oh, if they're different versions, right. then some of the software is proprietary. Right, thank you. And that's wrong. Look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash selling exceptions dot html. Thanks for coming, Dr. Stallman. Um, isn't uh, usability of software a key factor in its adoption? So therefore, it may be. So wouldn't it be useful to ask designers to join the free software movement to make free Absolutely. software more usable? Absolutely. We ask people to help with whatever skills they have. Is there a good precedent for <laughs> designers collaborating and making a difference, making free software more usable? I don't know. I don't know very many of these designers. Basically, programmers will start a free software project, but, and then designers, well, I don't know how to find them, but if you can find any designers that might want to help improve a free software project, they can write to the developers themselves, or if it's a GNU package, they can write to me. Very good. Because I think that's important, and I will ask the developers of that GNU package to please collaborate with the designers. 
And one more question. What do you think about Twitter in terms of a big platform that at least tries to be tr transparent and have a... Goal? I'm not interested in transparent. That's not what I fight for. Twitter has a problem now, which it didn't have a couple of years ago. It's trying to track its users. And I'm told that it's... I, I've read that some accounts get shut down because they connect through Tor. Well, that's bad. And last question, what do you think about the do not track protocol? And do you think that's a, something that should be adopted or abandoned for some I think it's just not enough. Basically, I browse the web through Tor because I don't want them to know who I am. I'm not concerned with their showing me ads. That's not the... That's not what's bad about the tracking. What's bad about the tracking is that Big Brother can find out where you've been and what you've done. That's really dangerous. That a company might show you different ads is at worst annoying. <clears throat> so to see what I believe about surveillance, look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash surveillance vs democracy.html. The level of surveillance in this country is a threat to democracy. Democracy cannot withstand the level of surveillance that we have. It's more than in the Soviet Union. We've got to knock it way down so that it's less than what the Soviet Union did to people, so that it's not enough to identify dissidents and whistleblowers. Hi, thank you for speaking. Um, I work in artificial intelligence, and I'm often finding myself trying to write programs that improve themselves based on observed user behavior. Is there a way for me to observe user behavior without generating malicious software? Well, not all users, but uh, some users might be willing to be observed some of the time. Thank you for coming. Um, there's a group of students in uh, the new school who are really concerned about surveillance uh, and software that are not uh, secure and not free. And I have a very, a rather mundane question for you, actually. Um, trying to engage students in, uh, in trying to engage students with uh, more uh, safer and better habits. Uh, regarding their digital life, we struggle to find steps towards a better uh, user. If you could get to a more specific, concrete question. It is, yeah, definitely. My question is, um, would you recommend a way to step into that, uh, step into free software rather than suddenly installing uh, a different what operational you could try, system? You could switch to LibreOffice first. LibreOffice? LibreOffice right. will run on Windows. Mm -hmm. What about email clients and things like well, that? Well, you know, there are free email clients. I use Emacs for that. Oh, okay. uh, but there's also <clears throat> Ice Dove, which is our variant of Thunderbird. <clears throat> Great. Can we find, is there a resource where we can find uh, a list of that kind of solution? Well, we have our free software directory, directory.fsf.org. Well, it lists around 14,000 free programs. Uh, whether that's what you need or not, I don't know. I don't know. Actually, we do. We have uh, somewhere, there's a, in gnu.org, there's a, a page of free software that runs on Windows that helps people start moving towards free software. Good. I saw it a few weeks ago, but I don't remember exactly its name. Okay, but well, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. What email service do you use and what email services would you I recommend? use the Free Software Foundation's email. Well, you got a ser server, a young server over there, right? Yeah. Well, what about people that cannot afford <clears throat> on a server? Well, we have a list described of, of mail services that you can use with free software. It's in fsf.org slash resources. Um, we cannot uh, affirm anything about their respect for privacy. 
because you'd have to get inside their sites to know that. What we can tell is that they work without any non-free software. All right. Thank you. And another question. It seems to me that um, Free Software Foundation and GNU um, lacks um, public relations and propaganda. Uh, what major projects Free Software Foundation work on uh, spreading the word out there? <coughs> We have campaign staff that uh, ask people to send a message to so-and-so demanding this or complaining about that. Um, are there any uh, bigger or more uh, precise? Uh, I don't understand the question. It's too vague. Well, the thing is, <clears throat> we, we all know that Microsoft and Apple and other corporations use um, psychoanalysis and other social manipulations in order to pro propagate the services and the software for people. Is there any way we can use the same techniques in order to spread mm -hmm. the word? I don't think so. I'm not sure it would be honest, but then I can't judge because I don't know what you're talking about. <coughs> but in any case, we don't have the sort of money that they have, so we're limited in what we can do. Thank you. Uh, the FSF has uh, 11 or 12 staff, much smaller than Microsoft and Apple. <laughs> so, uh, it's an honor to hear you speak. Uh, good to see you. Um, I, I guess uh, what I'm curious about is uh, if you consider the microcontroller in your wireless mic and the firmware running there, what are the ethical considerations for both the creators of If it's not meant to be changed, you can treat it as a circuit. It is a circuit, but from the user standpoint, selecting such a device for use, what ethical considerations does he have? Should he try to... Well, I'm saying you can consider it a circuit, so the issues of software don't have to be... Con you don't have to be considered. It becomes software when it's on a computer, which is a universal computing device when, uh, when there different programs are going to be installed in there. Then the question is, do you get to decide which program to install in there? I have a microwave oven. I don't know whether it has a computer inside. Undoubtedly it does. What? Undoubtedly it has a computer Well, device. I don't know that. It fetches instructions. I don't know it's that. I don't know that. It could be a special purpose chip. They it could have made it either way. And the point is it makes no difference, because if it is a computer, the software will never be changed. So the point is it might as well be a special purpose chip. We don't, the, the issues arise when the software is to be changed. If it doesn't have capabilities, capabilities to phone home or back doors. Right. Then it's well, of course, you know, a circuit could have mal malware in it too. Once the thing is talking to the network, then e if it is software or if it's hardware, either way, it could be malicious. Can you render something free by taking it away from taking away from it the ability to speak to the outside world? You can render the issue moot. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have a question about software architecture. The, the kind of software you write when you're focused on building devices and software uh, art artifacts that you can sell is it, very different from the kind of software that you write when the system is designed to be uh, transparent and the source code visible at every moment. Of course, those are not the same as free software. We're, <coughs> it's not the same. We're not campaigning for transparency, I need to point out. That's, that's a weakened goal. It's not enough. Yes, uh, I, I, I agree it's not the same goal and it's this, not the same thing, but the, the two are related in the sense that uh, you will end up with a very different architecture if you think in terms of closed system than if you think in terms of... Uh, Maybe, research. but I'm not interested in closed or open. I'm not a campaign. I don't campaign for open. I don't campaign for transparent. I campaign for respecting our freedom. I do not want to let the discussion to get sidetracked onto mere transparency. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. 
I guess we're done. Goody.